Hello, and welcome to another episode of Common Sense with Dr. Ben Carson. I'm your host, Ben Carson. And uh, all of you have heard the term deep state. And you know there's something going on. It doesn't sound good. And uh, we have an opportunity today to find out what it is. We're going to be talking to Cash Patel, someone who has really seen the deep state from up close. And he knows its impact and he's fighting against it. And he wrote a new book uh, that President Trump called The Blueprint for Taking Back the Government. The book is called Government Gangsters, The Deep State, The Truth, and The Battle for Our Democracy. Welcome, Cash, and thank you for your tremendous service to our country. Hey, Dr. Carson, it's an honor to be with you. Thanks so much. And it was lovely to see you at your ACI annual gala. What a spectacular event there at George Washington's that, house. That was fun, wasn't it? Well, uh, you've had an interesting public service career, serving at the highest levels of government as a congressional staffer. You've worked in the executive branch. You've worked as a lawyer, as a public defender. Uh, Tell us a little bit about your background and how you got interested in the government in the first place. Um, I guess, you know, if you if you want to make God laugh, just tell him your plan. I thought I was going to go out and be a millionaire and go to law school and be that guy in that fancy show suits. But I uh, uh, left law school with 185000 in debt and became a public defender in Miami-Dade County with a salary of $36,500. And it was the best thing that ever happened to me. Mm. Um, I was uh, fortunate to learn due process and the meaning of the Constitution's first five, six amendments firsthand and meet out justice, um, where it was deprived of so many to so many minorities and to so many people who were overcharged by the state. And that, that kind of just um, stayed with me and I became a federal public defender. And then I wanted to change sides and go over to the national security side and became a terrorism prosecutor. And, you know, the government service, um, actually grows on you when you find missions that you can just align yourself with. And I was very fortunate from there um, to work in the military as a civilian and then go on to uh, serve Devin Nunes and be the lead investigator for Russiagate and then over to the White House under President Trump. So um, it's it's been no job is a job that I ever thought I would have. Most of them I didn't even know existed. And uh, I've been very fortunate. Well, that must have been uh, kind of interesting, uh, counterterrorism, intelligence, special operations, uh, especially for a young man. And did you kind of see yourself in the James Bond role? <laughs> <laughs> well, as my, as my friends who are actually the James Bonds of the world, the SEAL Team 6 and Delta operators would always joke with me, everybody wants to touch the magic. Um, and it was, um, it was probably my favorite role standing side by side with those folks and figuring out who the bad guys were, who the terrorists were, who were taking American hostages and working with the government apparatus, um, both in Democrat and Republican administrations to, to go out and really effectuate the national security mission. And to see that and to operate at that level uh, was, was really interesting for me to learn the intersection of intelligence and sort of policy writ large from a global government position. And um, I think that suited me well down the road in the Trump administration. Well, you know, we hear lots of people talking about the deep state, but can you tell us what it actually is? <laughs> I might have to rename it, Dr. Carson. It might be the uh, open and in your face deep state. Uh, my first taste of it was when I was a national security prosecutor. I actually led the Benghazi prosecutions for Maine justice when Eric Holder was the attorney general. And we had charged and wanted to find about 16 of the individuals responsible for killing four American citizens. And I remember in a meeting with him, um, he was being briefed and he said, nope, me and the president are going to charge this one guy, this one terrorist. And I said, what about the rest? I don't understand what's going on here. We just, we just lost four Americans serving overseas. And the, sum the summary short answer was, it wasn't palatable to, to put that many people under prosecution for a terrorist attack. And, and you know better than anyone what Susan Rice did and went out there and lied to the world and mm -hmm. what Hillary Clinton did. And it just became so overly political. That was my first encounter with the deep state. But that as I carried on the mission, Russiagate sort of metastasized the deep state. And it wasn't a Republican or Democratic thing. It was just, you're putting out the truth and you're exposing our FBI, DOJ, intelligence community cover up corruption. And we can't have that. And um, I would just see that at so many levels, even in the Trump administration. 
administration. How in the world do we counter the fact that so many people think the the deep state is just a, a right wing conspiracy theory? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I I think listening to you and your show is a great start, and we have to just you know one of the things I learned from from President Trump and and Devin Nunes and a lot of other folks was you know putting finding the truth is step one, exposing the DOJ's corruption. Um, at the FISA court, for example, during Russiagate, where they lied to a federal judge just to illegally surveil a political opponent, and then cor- coming after us in the media, me, a congressional staffer, even unlawfully surveilling me. Um, that's just step one. Then you have to go out there and you have to tell the world, and you have to tell the world over and over again. And when you've said it a million times, you've only just begun saying it. So I think the mission to educate people on the deep state continues because so many in the past were lied to by, remember the the deep state's partner is the mainstream media. There is no deep state without them. And they did so much of the lying from Russiagate on to Hunter Biden's laptop to the 51 Intel letter and everything in between that we have to go back out there and re-educate the masses to say, it wasn't a right-wing conspiracy. Here's the receipts from the government you were lied to. And slowly, I think we have been picking up people in the middle one by one. And I think um, we're gonna continue to do that. You started working in the DOJ under the Obama administration. Did you did you notice a change when Trump got elected? You know, I, I did. I remember walking into the halls of Maine Justice the next day after the election, and people at the DOJ who are supposed to be career apolitical prosecutors and staffers were commenting overtly politically on how they would have to save the Department of Justice from a Donald Trump administration. And I just, I didn't understand why that was. And these were the same people, of course, the Comeys and McCabe's of the world across the street at the FBI, the Sally Yates's of the world who wrote her infamous, um, you know, resignation letter, chastising President Trump baselessly. And it would come to fruition probably a year or two later when I realized all these folks are in it together. Um, All these folks, and I'll just give you a quick example. Sally Yates works at Christopher Wray's old law firm right now with Rod Rosenstein and Gina Haspel, all making seven figure dollars. That law firm is actually representing the plaintiff in the Colorado case that's going on right now where they're trying to remove Donald Trump from the ballot. None of these are coincidences. And and uh, even though I may have started in that democratic regime in the Obama administration, this thing just seeps across all political spectrums. Well, uh, your book specifically mentions people like Christopher Ray, Merrick Garland, uh, Bill Barr, and uh, some judges and members of Congress. Are, are they all sort of part of this organization? And if they are, do they know they are? <laughs> if, they <didn't, laughs> if they didn't before, they do now. I have a list in the back of the book of every deep state offender that I ever came across in alphabetical order. And I think they actually know better than the rest. I think they know when, you know, likes of Christopher Ray and Rod Rosenstein were unlawfully surveilling congressional staffers, exposing their corruption. Um, I think they knew that they were protecting their names and the institution rather than exposing the truth. I think Bill Barr, who was the attorney general for Donald Trump, had every opportunity to come and expose all of that unlawful surveillance that we now know, thanks to the DOJ IG, that it was, and John Durham, that it was completely baseless and unwarranted to surveil Donald Trump. Bill Barr supposedly ran that investigation for two years, and all he ended up doing was resigning and coming out in the public and attacking Donald Trump because it became the popular thing to do. It became the, you know, the sort of rallying call for the deep state to say the media will glorify you. That same media that hated you for years and years, you will become their favorite figure. And on all the Sunday shows, as long as you go out and say, I'm going to get Donald Trump. And that was a unifying factor for the deep state. And it still is. Well, do you think uh, do you think it's popularity that they're seeking power, propagation of ideology? Uh, what what are they after? I think it's a little bit of all of the above. Look, these deep state government gangsters, as I call them, go into government not to serve the American people, but to service their own egos. You know, when you think about the Mark Millies and Espers of the world and you just keep adding to this layer of government gangsters, they're not in it to protect the DOD. 
or the FBI or the DOJ's mission. They're in it to protect their names at those institutions and they know exactly what they're doing. And they do it because they know there's a payout at the end of the day, both in the media and in the swamp. You know, the defense industrial complex, of course, gave Mark Esper a 10 figure golden parachute on the way out of DOD for failing to do his job there. But they knew if they went out there and attacked Trump, which he's since done and write a book and go on media, they're going to make tons of money. And they, quote unquote, are the only ones that saved the republic. And I found that highly ironic since all of these people are supposed to follow the rule of law, the AG, the SecDef, the CIA director, et cetera, were the ones breaking the chain of command from President Trump when he issued directives to, for example, end the forever wars, to secure the border, to make sure there's not a two-tier system of justice and to have internal accountability when the FBI and DOJ lies to a federal court, where are those prosecutions? And people have lost faith in the systems of justice, but the people who haven't lost faith are those close cohorts of government gangsters who continue to be on the Sunday show circles and mainstream media outlets and get glorified with book deals. And that's what Washington became, this revolving door that President Trump, I think, just shattered and they hate him for it. Yeah, I, I've, I don't think I've ever seen anybody hate it so much by <laughs> establishment <laughs> as Donald Trump because he's an iconoclast. He doesn't, uh, doesn't go by their rules. And they certainly don't want to see him come back. But uh, why did you decide to write this book? I mean, <laughs> you could have gone on and just uh, had a nice, peaceful life. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think I think Dr. Carson, you and I are somewhat driven by uh, some similarities, and that's our, above all, our our desire to to improve this country for future generations. And if we're going down the path we're going down right now. It is going to be a precipitous downfall for our children and, and their children. So I spoke to President Trump and, and about his future plans, and this was a couple of years ago. And he said, look, if you're going to, you know, we need to put together a roadmap if we're going to get to do this again. But we're not just going to highlight the problems. What are the solutions? And I think to me, I took a collective career and I put, I stamped into the back of the book how we solve these problems of a two-tier system of justice, of a weaponized intelligence community, of a politicized DOD, and how we put the national security mission back front and center. So I think that was the impetus. One, to educate the public that these are not right-wing conspiracy theories. That's why I included the government's own documents in my book. But also there are solutions to that. So it's not just a, you know, a Debbie Downer, Downer book that says everything's bad, it can't be saved. It can be, and I think, <laughs> You know, I was blessed to have a great team help me write this book because, you know, writing is just not my strong suit. And uh, it, was a, it was a monumental lift, but I did not expect, maybe I was naive, that the Biden administration would actually take 10 blocks to block the release of government gangsters. Maybe that was the most surprising part about it, but I guess that was the final component of the deep state rising up to try to do yeah. its last bit of dirty work. Well, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting how uh, they have this complicated network of people and organizations. Uh, and then they end up doing just the opposite of what they're trying to do, because as they're trying to persecute and prosecute uh, Donald Trump, if they'd just been fair to him, he would have been just about done now with his second term and they'd be done with him. <laughs> and now they're going to have to deal with him <laughs> well into the future. So that's, that's they, kind they've of pretty funny. much given him three terms now. You're right. 12 yeah. instead of eight years. Cash, did the, did the deep state's mission change uh, when Trump came along? You know, before the, they, they sort of gained a lot of power after 9 11. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, they were surveilling. American citizens. Ed, Edward Snowden said, they're there. I've experienced them. Um, but then it seemed like uh, all of their focus suddenly was on Trump. Did, did, did you sort of make that observation? Yeah, I, th I think you're right, Dr. Carson. I think it was more fragmented going back 20, 20, 30 years ago. And yes, you're right to point out the abuses um, that we caught uh, former DNI Clapper on and former CIA Director Brennan on, not just surveilling mm -hmm. Senate staffers, but illegally using the FISA collection process to surveil American citizens. That's 
definitely a component of the deep state, but I don't think it's an accident. You know, one of the themes in my book is there are no coincidences. Those two same individuals would come in with those surveillance programs onto Donald Trump. I think when Donald Trump came down the escalator and demolished um, the the lifelong dreams of career politicians to be the commander in chief, they just were not about to let that be uh, the, the talk of Tinseltown there. And what they tried to do is take him out with Russiagate. Hillary Clinton, we all know about that, the Steele dossier and everything they did. I was a chief investigator for Devin Nunes. And they came in quietly when we were exposing their corruption there. They were all galvanized together, not just Democrats, but the Republicans too. And I think what Donald Trump did to them more than anything else, besides ruin their opportunity of swamp advancement, is essentially recast the Republican regime. Um, and also, ironically, take somewhat moderate democratic positions of not going to war and bringing our troops home and spending money within America. And he did the thing that even Democrats said they would do, but could not do. So by ending the wars and securing the border and taking on Russia and having a tremendous economy, I think his four years of success are what really ticked them off. And they were like, wait a second, you're ruining how we operate in Washington, DC. How are we gonna get rich when you actually came in and did the things you campaigned on you were going to do, how dare you? And that's probably why there was such a visceral reaction to him uh, when he came in. I mean, it was like nothing anybody has ever seen before. I sound like him now. <laughs> no one's <laughs> ever seen this before. <laughs> but uh, interestingly enough, what do you think are the implications of using the justice system against a political opponent like Donald Trump? What what are the long-term implications of that? I mean, you know, I, I, I've spoken to the president, you know, and, and you do too often. I, I told him, in my opinion, one of the central tenets to your to his campaign should be destroying the two-tier system of justice. As a former public defender and national security prosecutor, I can think of no greater harm to our constitutional republic than not having a justice system that actually meets out due process. Mm -hmm. And when these people started weaponizing it for political gain, it started to be like, oh, is this Venezuela? Are we down in some, you know, Southeast Asian dictatorship? Are, are we in the halls of, of, of some, um, you know, uh, you know, regime out of Central Africa where people are prosecuted for their personal beliefs? And sadly, when it started with Donald Trump, they were like, no, no, that could never happen. The FBI and DOJ would never do that. And they did. But then they did it to everybody else. Then they started going into churches and houses of worship. Then they started going into school board meetings and saying, whoa, 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 you can't have our children educated in history and facts. We need to talk about gender dynamics. And Chris Ray has been at the head of this entire behemoth, along with Merrick Garland now, authorizing these types of maneuvers. And one of the latest to just break in the last week or so is that over a dozen staffers in Congress were unlawfully surveilled by Rod Rosenstein and Chris Ray um, back in 2017 and 18 when we were when we were exposing Russiagate. I actually filed a federal lawsuit against Rosenstein and Ray and a slew of other DOJ and FBI officials, not because it's going to get me rich, but because in order to annihilate the deep state and destroy them, we have to expose them in court. At the same time, we have to take the court system and reorient it back to a singular plane of justice. And that's not an easy mission, but I think the, you know, Donald Trump can lead that charge, but we on the ground level, me, have to go out there and show everyday Americans that A, this happened, B, there's a solution, and C, you're not alone. And it's a galvanizing force, but it's critical to me to restore the rule of law. It, it, it doesn't exist when Merrick Garland goes to the podium and says, there's only one system of justice. He's probably the biggest liar and worst attorney general in modern U.S. history. Well, it's it's pretty amazing how many people in the administration just deny reality. You know, how can you say we have complete control of the border when there are millions of people flowing across the border? <laughs> it just makes no sense at all. You have to be uh, fairly non-thinking to accept those things. But uh, can you discuss the disparity between the suits against Trump and the ones against Biden, 
with our justice system. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm basically, I'm probably close to that one, having dealt with classified documents prosecutions. And, you know, the law's pretty simple. And I know you know this, Dr. Carson. A president can declassify anything he wants. He's the universal arbiter of classification authority in the United States of America. He can also, under the Presidential Records Act, take with him whatever he wants, as was proven by the Clinton sock drawer case. So whether or not the American public likes the fact that Donald Trump took documents is something that needs to be adjudicated at the polls. That's not a legal question for jurors and judges to opine on. Um, but then you have Joe Biden's case, who as a sitting senator and vice president took reams of classified material. He has no presidential records um, access. And that's just the tip of the spear. People are seeing, oh, we have special counsels. And I think this is a story for another day, but I think special counsels are just a ruse for deep state actors to come in and say, oh, we've appointed, you know, Donald Trump appointee to go look at Joe Biden's case and everything's going to be just fine. Um, I think that we are so beyond a course correction in DOJ and the halls of justice that what we must do right now to get to 2024 is show people that these two prosecutions alone, these two investigations alone, the fact that they hid the investigation about Joe Biden the week before the election, but leaked everything about Donald Trump, his entire presidency shows you that DOJ and FBI will break their own law of releasing classified information for political gain, to advance a political narrative, to leak mm -hmm. it to the fake news and the mainstream media. And we have to go out there and prosecute those individuals. And that's what I've told President Trump, you know, the second he's back in power, we have to go out there and actually prosecute the leakers of intelligence in the IC, the leakers of the intelligence and evidence in the DOJ and FBI. And we have to track them down. We cannot let them become hypocrites and heroes in the same process because the mainstream media was going to glorify their work to quote unquote, get Trump. It's going to be a rough year. There's going to be multiple cases. I don't know how they're going to shake out, but um, it's, uh, I think it exposes a little more every time of their corruption. Right. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting. One of the things that people have admired about our system for the longest time is the system of checks and balances. But if the DOJ is compromised, what is the check on the executive branch? Well, it used to be as uh, it used to be constitutional oversight by Congress, the legislative branch. Remember, the FBI, the DOJ, the DOD, as when I talk about government gangsters, they report constitutionally to the committees of jurisdiction in the House of Representatives and in the United States Senate. But sadly, I think even this Republican majority right now has ceded that constitutional mandate over to the executive branch itself. And we don't have the judges anymore, not that we really ever did, but we've seen the political activists that the judges have become. So our last bastion of resolution for just judicial uh, harmony is Congress. And, you know, when we issue, when Congress issues six or seven subpoenas to Merrick Garland and Chris Ray, and they violate every single one of those subpoenas, and there's no action taken by Congress, we are seeing a two-tier system of justice in the administrative process as well, because other individuals were prosecuted for a felony of being held in contempt of Congress. And right. while I understand that we don't have the DOJ and those prosecutions might not be warranted, what we did during Russiagate was we went and fenced their money. I'm not saying defund the FBI. I'm just saying, I don't think Chris Ray needs a government funded G5 jet to vacation off to the Adirondacks while he's violating federal subpoenas. And Merrick Garland doesn't need a fleet of new SUVs and Escalades to drive him around town. Take pockets of money and they will show up with the doc. Because at the end of the day, this, this is the hardest thing I, I, I'm able to relay to people. And it's one of my biggest messages in the book. We have to get the documents from Congress. So the American people can read them themselves. They don't want to be read to and fed to. And if we can get the FBI and DOJ documents of corruption, which I know exists because the one thing about those government gangsters is they write down their own corruption because they think they'll never get caught. And we have to demand from Congress they do better. That's our last hope until 2024. We also got to start impeaching some judges, but that's not going to happen until later. <laughs> <All right. laughs> well, before we take another break, maybe you could just explain to our audience the difference between the deep state and the administrative state. I think it's the deep state is just operating out, you know, not just in the halls of justice, but
but they're operating in Congress and in the judiciary. They're operating at, at the National Archives of all places by making referrals to DOJ for Donald Trump, but not Hillary Clinton and Joe Biden, whose emails they've had for 10 years. So when I say the administrative state, I think the deep state has crept into that space and is weaponizing and politicizing justice at the same level people are doing it when bringing prosecutions in DOJ and FBI spaces. And to me, it's equally as deadly to the constitutional republic because it is chipping away and destroying our ability to govern uh, without weaponizing pol pol justice. Yeah, a, a technical question. Um, you know, Hillary Clinton, uh, as Secretary of State, destroyed evidence blatantly and nothing was done about it. Did, did Congress have any ability to do anything in that situation or was it completely a DOJ decision? It was largely a DOJ decision. Here's the one thing Congress can do. And here's the one thing I recommend in my book to Donald Trump too. Uh, the day he's elected and inaugurated, he needs to take away forever all of their security clearances. All of these government gangsters, all these former directors and secretaries of state go out there and ride the circuit and have seven figure contracts because they hold a security clearance. And the one thing Congress can do is zero out those budgets overnight, save Americans hundreds of millions of dollars in taxpayer money, and at the same time, meet out some measure of accountability so they don't make money off of corrupting and weaponizing justice. But we're going to need DOJ back fully if we're ever going to have any sort of accountability. You're right. Hillary Clinton got off scot-free. Well, I, I hope that uh, our congressman will read your book <laughs> and take it to heart <laughs> because, you know, President Trump did say it is the framework. It is the guideline for how we manage the, the state. And I think he knows. I think he's very familiar with the deep state, probably <laughs> more so than anybody else having yeah. been the victim of it. Uh, which is probably the reason they don't want to see him come back. And we're back with Common Sense, uh, talking with uh, Cash Patel, his new book, Government Gangsters, The Deep State, The Truth, and the Battle for Our Democracy. It really tells us a lot. And there are a lot of people who aren't too happy that he wrote this book. <laughs> and, uh, you know, tried to push it away, but uh, it's out there. And I hope you'll get a copy of it. So, Cash, uh, how do we reverse course here? I mean, is, is this thing fixable or are we just too far gone now? Um, close to both. Um, I, I think it's fixable. But we're, we are at that point that, in my opinion, if we don't um, advance and win in 2024 behind Donald Trump, then that, then that might be it. I don't know. I can't prognosticate the future, but having been in for 16 years and having seen the erosion of justice by the deep state, the weaponization by the administrative state and the politicization by the heads of the Department of Defense, putting the national security mission second and their own egos and advancement first, I think people have now finally started to see examples at every single level. But the solution as we were talking about earlier, is not just an executive branch personnel solution. It's a multi-branch, legislative branch, judicial branch, administrative state solution requiring budgeting processes, personnel, accountability, actual prosecutions internally within government to find those people that have corrupted and broken the law themselves that worked at DOJ, FBI, and DOD. And if they're cabinet secretary, so be it. Their title does not give them a get out of jail free pass. We have to collectively bring those forces together. And we have to do the one thing that DC hates to do, which is give the media the Heisman, not care what they're gonna hate us. If if Donald Trump wins and 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 we're back in there doing this and we're, we're laying out the roadmap that we talked about, they are going to say some nasty things. I mean, they've already said it to you and to me, but uh, it might go on hyperdrive and we just got to not care. Because the one thing I learned is if they're doing that to you, you're over the target and you just got to keep going. But to do it, as I, you know, as I go around the country and speak to folks, you know, if, if we don't win, it's not, it's not Donald Trump's fault that we didn't win. I tell audiences, it's your fault for not engaging. And I'm telling them, don't take the bait. Don't say the hyperbolic things the left wants you to say. Don't be the crazy person. Go out there and just educate people and say, I'm not here to tell you I told you so. 
here's some documents you may not have seen about Russiagate, about Ukraine 1, about Ukraine 2, about the 51 Intel letter, whatever, right? About the next iteration of Russiagate that the Democrats are working on. You were lied to back then. I think they're going to lie to you again. And this is how you bring them over. People in the middle of America are coming over. And it's not about mean tweets or anything. It's about who's going to get the job done. And I think we've done a good job in bringing those people over behind Donald Trump's leadership, but it's up to us to engage the community and get them going. Well, I always say, if America is to be saved, it'll be saved by the people. Government's not going to fix itself. (laughs) Uh, and, And governments all have a tendency to do the same thing, no matter how they start. Their goals can be quite lofty and noble but they grow, they infiltrate, and they dominate. And, uh, you know, our founders gave us a document that was supposed to preserve us and keep that from happening here. And it has worked for 240 plus years, but uh, I think we're probably as close to losing the Republic right now as we have ever been, as you very adeptly say, if 24 doesn't change things then I think the seeds will be too mature. The the trees will have grown. The forest will be there. You'll never find your way out of it. So we have uh, some definite work to do. What has been the, the reaction of the progressives on the left to your book? <laughs> uh, I think they've classified it a work of fiction. Um, but... Uh... You know, the more they attack us and and the book, the more I know we got it right. You know, to bring it up to modern day um, histrionics, what's going on, the war in Israel, um, people have called me as a former deputy director of national intelligence and say, you know, how did we miss this? And my response was, we didn't miss it. When you reorient the national security mission, the intelligence apparatus to collect information um, on climate change and the setting sun, and you prioritize that over... Um, collecting against terrorists, collecting against Hamas, collecting against Hezbollah. Israel did the same thing. They didn't miss it. They were looking elsewhere because the priorities of the administration changed. And so to me, that's the most glaring up-to-date example that when the mainstream media comes in and says, you can't read this book because it contains lies, I will go on any show and happily challenge them to point out a lie in my book that's backed by an actual government document. And of course, they're not going to have me on. But that just shows me that we, we, we have space we can carve back. We have space we can get back in the electorate. And we're never going to get 45% of the left, but we just need that, what, 7% in the middle? And, and that's what it takes to win, win a democracy and restore this constitutional republic. So I know CNN and uh, the New York Times and uh, MSNBC have been bashing me since the book was announced, um, but they're trying to drown it out right now. So I'm just thankful that you know, I'm able to talk about it on such a great platform with you, doctor. Yeah, I I always tell people, sometimes they get discouraged. I said, if they're attacking you, it's it's only because you're irritating them. And you (laughs) wouldn't be irritating them if you weren't relevant to what's going on. So I really appreciate the fact that you were willing to do that. Now, do do you have an impression of why the deep state uh, is going along with opening our borders. It seems logical that whether you're on the right or the left, you would realize the end of this could not be good. I do. And, you know, being a heavy national security intel law enforcement guy, I simplified it in my book because I found it was the actual only answer. And the answer from the left was, what did Donald Trump do on the national security front? We're going to do the opposite. Joe Biden literally campaigned on it. We're not going to take on Iran. We're going to bend the knee to Russia and the CCP. Uh, We're going to let the border be open. We're not going to take on the cartel and human trafficking and the Chinese fentanyl that's killing our children. And all of these things are directly related because they, their hatred for Trump and his successes actually caused them to put the safety of America second 
and put their own egos first. And the mainstream media, of course, came in and said, oh, Trump's policies were racist. How dare he ban travel to China um, after we and I briefed him on where COVID origins actually came. He was acting on intelligence, just to give you one example. So they excoriated him. And then, of course, a year or two later, we find out he was right. And then they're on to their next narrative. And I think it's directly related. What's going on right now with Hamas, Hezbollah, and Iran, and the southern border gap, they have been seeding, our enemies have been seeding through the southern border, terrorists into this country. And and Mayorkas just admitted last month that they have two dozen known terrorist affiliates that illegally crossed, and the FBI and DHS doesn't know where they are. That's not an accident. That's what happens when you politicize the border. That's what happens when you say, oh, Donald Trump built a wall and secured it. We're going to take the wall down and let everybody in. And it unfortunately, tragically, having dealt with a lot of counterterrorism operations, these terrorists have a lot of patience. And I don't know or think they're going to do anything in the near future, but they could do something down the road, which is very scary. But their singular mission of the radical left, the Biden administration, the media is whatever Trump did, we're going to do the opposite. And look where we are two and a half years three years down the road after that decision. making. Well, it's fascinating because the things that he did resulted in good, (laughs) demonstrable good. Right. You know, lowest unemployment rates, uh, energy independence, uh, respect on the world stage, getting NATO allies to pay their share, uh, a secure border. I mean, it's, it's sort of nutty to think the things that worked are the things that you should be against. It really doesn't matter whether you're Republican or Democrat, left or right. Common sense would say that. And it almost seems as if ideology and hatred have trumped common sense. And what the founders used to always talk about, the common good. It seems like those things have been thrown away uh, for political advantage. And uh, there's a reason that the Marxists refer to people like that as useful idiots, because they're actually destroying themselves and don't seem to actually realize the impact of what they're doing. And uh, what is the what is the last word you have to our audience in terms of what they should take away from this book and what they themselves can do as individual Americans? Uh, Well, I appreciate it. Grab a copy at governmentgangsters.com or wherever books are sold. But the whole point is just get a piece of it and educate yourselves and your community. I always tell people, pick one issue. You're not Donald Trump and you're not running for national office. School board, sheriff, town council, education, countering drugs, taking on tip, pick one issue and go out there on platforms like this and other censorship free platforms like Truth Social or what have you, and post your messages and talk to a community, you will be shocked at how engaged people are right now. I think the one good thing of all the bad and negative that we've talked about is that this has been a great civics lesson for a lot of Americans who never paid attention before. They now know how the court system works. They now care about how the FBI and DOJ weaponized justice. They now have more of a say in their local political elections than they ever did before. And I think that's a win for us because our children need to be educated in the same manner. So my message to them is whatever you do, we're going to come out for the next year, for the next 370, however many days it is, the next election cycle, and go as hard as we can to educate you. And if you think you're alone, you're not, come find us, whether it's in government gangsters or what have you, we will be there uh, to provide you with the material you need. Because as Dr. Carson and I have said, This mission that we are on, a mission first mentality, which is the theme of my book, can only be achieved if we do it together. I have to add a hearty amen to that. And (laughs) uh, thank you so much for your willingness to get out there and to be a target. Because, uh, you know, what you're doing is very similar to what some of our founders did. Some of the people who fought so hard for freedom in this country in the beginning and People have to recognize, as Ronald Reagan said, you know, our freedom is never more than one generation away. And if you're going to be the land of the free, you have to be the home of the brave. You've got to be willing to stand up for what you believe in. You clearly have demonstrated that standing up. And I'm sorry, your initial dream 
of becoming a, a Wall Street millionaire didn't work out, but this turned out a heck of a lot better. So <laughs> thank you for what you're doing for our country. Thank you, Dr. Carson. It's an honor to be with you. Well, I hope you enjoyed that uh, time that we had with Cash Patel. He's a brave young man writing a book like Government Gangsters, The Deep State, The Truth, and the battle for our democracy. And it is a battle. It's a battle that we all need to be engaged in. So for your prescription for this week, get engaged. Go out and find out what's going on in your local community. Yes, it's fun and it's interesting to follow national politics. But where the rubber meets the road is right there in your local community. And uh, find out who's running for the school board. Who are these people? What do they represent? What are their views? Uh, from the governor all the way down to the dog catcher. Make sure you know who the heck you're talking about because they're the ones who actually affect your life from day to day. And that's in the program for this week. Uh, make sure you always listen. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher. And uh, you can also go to AmericanCornerstone.org and get a link to all of the podcasts. Make sure you rate us, review us, tell your friends and family, because we need to make common sense common once again. And remember the Cornerstone principles, faith, liberty, community, and life. See you next week. 